right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. If you can't hear me, uh, let me know in the chat. I'm able to view the chat and I will fix that right up. But last time, I don't think we had a problem with the audio. Hey, thank you, Tina. <laughs> uh, great. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Doreen Purke. I currently work as a solutions architect with uh, Amazon Web Services. At the time where I submitted this uh, talk, I was working as a senior platform engineer at Auth0. Uh, Auth0 is an authentication as a service company. I worked there for about three years and uh, learned a lot of great lessons uh, having to be on call and architecting systems that had to be up all the time, um, pretty much 24 seven because authentication can never be down. Uh, so this talk is a lot of the learnings that I've learned over the years working at Auth0 and other companies. Previous to Auth0, I worked at a small startup in Louisville, Kentucky, and then where I'm based. <laughs> I think most of you all are based out of Louisville as well. Um, and then previous to that, I uh, was working at GE. Um, so most of the my career has been in back-end infrastructure, your sysadmin jobs your um, and recently DevOps and platform engineering roles. So um, this is pretty relevant if you, this talk is pretty relevant if you are, um, well, in my opinion, it's relevant to everyone. This is something that a topic that I'm extremely passionate about um, and I try to preach about it as much as possible. So uh, with that, let's go, let's go ahead and get started to the next slide. So um, before I get to what a cell-based architecture actually means, I'm aware that it's not necessarily a very popular term. Uh, I want to talk about what a typical architecture looks like. Uh, and this could be anywhere. This could be on premises or it could be uh, in any cloud providers, um, whether if it's AWS, Azure, or GCP, or anything like that. So a typical architecture given something like a three-tiered app is essentially you have your servers that are serving your traffic behind a load balancer and then you have a database uh, and then your users come into the load balancer either you know there's a there could be a this is very simplified there could be a cdn there could be firewalls there could be uh you know many different things before your load balancer and uh if you're using a cloud platform like aws the load balancer is scaling up behind the scenes uh, and then you would have your servers where you know actual requests go to from the load balancer and then you would have your database so the problem with this um, architecture is that you could have failing scenarios and i'm going to talk about some of my experiences where i was where i was woken up at 2 a.m at these weird hours because of these failures and these scenarios that i'm going to go through are not necessarily the only scenarios it's just that the ones i picked are the ones that i've seen occur a lot um but there are many ways this architecture can fail one of the ways it can fail is that um, your database can start having problems um, an example of that is that uh, i have been i have been running mongodb clusters across many regions and environments so each environment has its own uh, mongodb cluster uh, but everyone's data was on there and uh, when something happened to this database uh, in our case an index was missing so the performance of the database was greatly impacted we had one of our biggest outages uh, that we had ever seen and i happened to be uh, on call for that uh, so that out outage actually lasted for four hours and the reason and it initially started as a partial outage but as you can see you know your database being your source of truth you will eventually have a hundred percent failure and that's what we had the database was overloaded we had 40 percent cpu percentage utilization and it was not coming down at some point it reached 80 percent and all our uh, this architecture was also built on top of AWS, and all our instances connecting to the database were failing. 
uh, because they no longer could pass the health checks and connect to the database. Eventually, we were serving all the United States traffic uh, with these 20 servers. And eventually, we were down to two uh, servers. And when we were down to two, the traffic was not changing. The traffic was still coming. Uh, so those servers were also overloaded. We were not able to bring up any uh, new servers up and running because they couldn't connect to our already overloaded and failed database. So that became 100% um, failure. Now, if you're interested, the way uh, it was mitigated was that uh, it was I decided to route the traffic to another cluster that was essentially was the same uh, setup, but scale that cluster up and start routing the um, traffic over, cutting the traffic over, and that way we were able to mitigate the outage and then later on investigate what happened. So that's one scenario. Another scenario is um, multi-tenancy and noisy neighbors. So a lot of times with this architecture, this is not the architecture for just one customer. You are hosting everyone's data on one database, and that database, uh, when I say one database, I don't necessarily mean uh, that it's just one instance or one lonely server. It could be like a primary secondary situation. You have a database cluster, but still all your customer's data is in this giant database um, on this infrastructure that is multi-tenant. So the problem with this is that you can have your customer A, B, and C, and D. Customer A will start having a spike in request. Um, either, you know, it's it's some event, you know, if there's a like a sports event and they're a customer that does any anything with live streaming sports and all that, or it's just unexpected. Maybe they're having a DOS attack or something similar. So they would have a spike in request. And what happens is that this failure just trickles down all this steps. So it will affect your load balancer. So your load balancer has to scale. Uh, if you are in a cloud platform, you might not have an issue with this layer. The load balancer just scales behind the scene. It will trickle down to your servers. Maybe you won't have an issue with this either, but it will start affecting you and it will eventually start putting too much load on your database. The problem with that is your other customers, B, C, and D, who are on the same database, are also going to see failures as well because the customer A ended up affecting everyone's business. So um, that's another scenario where noisy neighbors can affect uh, all of this cell, all of this um, infrastructure at once. The when I first started my career and I started building systems, I my goal was always to eliminate failure. And I, I tried to strive for perfection in a sense that every project that I did, I, I wanted to uh, reduce how much we would fail 100%. As I gained more experience, I realized that's just not possible you have to fail. Sometimes things fail and you just have to accommodate that. The reason for how I realized that everything just fails, sometimes it just happens, is just the theory of CAP theorem. So CAP theorem is basically has three pillars, availability, consistency, and partition tolerance. And it's basically that if you have partitions, you're going to have either choose one of two of these either availability or consistency. You cannot have all three of these in a distributed system. And I've taken the definition right out of the Wikipedia page because it's just, you know, very simple. Consistency, every read receives the most recent write or error, availability and partition tolerance, as you can read on the slide, very easy to understand. Um, and there are ways that you can conceal this uh, these failures, right? So you can conceal con consistency by building systems that are eventually consistent, not strongly consistent, but you can give yourself some room for error. Uh, but in our case for authentication servers, for example, it's not possible to do that. If you are um, building um, Facebook, for example, you can have your feed, Facebook feed to be an eventually consistent so that outages are invisible 
to the user. You're just showing them old material and all that. But in our case, it was not feasible. But this theory made me realize that you, I just have to accommodate failure and accept it as it comes and just be prepared for that. The other thing is Werner Vogels is the CTO of Amazon and he has a saying that says everything fails all the time. And that is very true. Um, you just have to make do with failures. Um, you cannot build a perfect system. You just have to be prefer prepared for that. And that's what the title of this talk is about is cell-based architecture is going to help you accommodate these failures. So what is a cell-based architecture? Now imagine this is the stack that we just had, um, exact same stack that I showed earlier. And again, this is simplified. In real world, you would have your cache layer, your you know your CDN and all that kind of things, but the simplified three-tiered uh, cell-based architecture. So you would have your first cell and then you have another cell. It is the exact same copy of um, the other uh, cell. It, it is a load balancer, it has servers, it has database. And then you have another cell. So you would have three cells. So basically three individuals of, um, of the same cell. What you would do is that you would have a routing layer at the top instead of having your you know, customers all go through uh, just one cell, you would have them go through this routing layer and they will get routed to different cells. The reason why this is better than the previous scenario is that if you imagine you would have a failure, like we just mentioned, I, you can't not have failures. The, everything fails all the time. You would have it in, in one cell. These cells don't communicate with each other. They don't know about each other. There's no data going between them. It's just a router, simple router layer at the top that is just routing the traffic to these different cells. So if one of the cells starts having problems, like the problems that we just mentioned in the beginning of the slide, uh, the database fails, any of those layers fail, um, it's just one of your cells is affected. So one third of your customers are affected. You will not have a uh, 100% outage. So this is what we call reducing the blast radius. So that's what we're doing uh, with cell-based architecture. So you might wonder, okay, so I have this um, cell-based architecture, I have this router layer, and it is pretty vague. How do I route? What does, how does that look like? So that router is essentially a control plane. It, it is, um, it should be architected as simple as possible. Um, and you can route in many different ways. Um, one of the ways you can route is shuffle sharding. And the concept of shuffle sharding is that if you have these uh, cells, and let's just say for the sake of availability, I'm gonna group these two cells into one uh, cell. And let's just say that I have customers A, B, C, D, E, F, G. The way you can put these customers into this um, but these cells is basically by shuffling them like you would shuffle cards. I have an example of that here. So you would just group them together. You would shuffle them. So F and G here, A and D here, E, D, A, C, and so on and so forth. The reason why this is effective is that, is that if you happen to fail one of these cells, so if you happen to fail one of these, so A, D fails, you still are saving A here, you're still serving D here. If you, let's just say you fail this the whole thing together, you will have serving A still from here, you're still serving D from these other areas, you're still ser serving F and G. So shuffle sharding is a very good way to distribute your um, multi-tenant environment. You distribute your who goes in what cell. Um, it is simple, it works very well for stateless applications. Um, and most of the, the layer here is stateless anyway. Your state 
is in your database. So you're just making a connection or a website or something to your database, right? So it is a very effective way for you to just shuffle um, your uh, customers or tenants around and spread them across your cells so that when one of them fails, you, you have still the other ones serving traffic. Now, this may not shuffle sharding in what I, when I researched shuffle sharding and I, you know, read about it, I found that to be a very, a very useful method. And it's like the method that um, Route 53, it's um, AWS as DNS uh, as a service system that has 100% SLA uses behind the scenes. So it has, it has a, its success, but I think you can also um, do some advanced mapping here. So again, the problem of noisy neighbor comes where, what if I do shuffle shard and I still have noisy neighbors? Um, and I still have um, one customer affecting a cell. And let me just say that um, that is still a better problem to have than having 100% outage and having that fail. Having like one of your cell fails, and you can have as many cells as you want. You can have three, you can have two, you can have hundreds, you can have thousands. Um, it's just up to you how big you want your you know data plane to be. When I say up to you, that just needs um, also a little bit of practice to figure out how many cells you need, uh, depending on your traffic and how many, um, uh, how, how big your cells should be. That is also a, a challenge to figure out as well. But given you have customers A, B, C, D, where do you put them in these cells uh, other than shuffle sharding? Um, so simply, I uh, would have a key value mapping and I would just store this in a you know key value um, database uh, and then I would say router for customer A always take him to cell 2 customer C take him to cell 3 customer B take him to cell cell 1 and if you want to actually do this and this is something that I have done I just didn't put it on this slide because I wanted to make it a bit like agnostic. I didn't want to make it like specific to my use case. But since I was building on top of AWS, um, what I did was I used DynamoDB is AWS a scalable key value uh, database. So I used that to store this data for a customer and a cell. And what I did in this um, router layer, I've used a CDN. So AWS's CloudFront is a, their CDN as a service. And I use uh, Lambda at the edge as my control plane, basically, as my router. So Lambda at the edge is basically the serverless Lambda functions. It's basically uh, runs at the edge locations where the CDN exists. So with CloudFront and Lambda at the edge, I was able to create a router that looks into my key value mapping and says, um, Oh, I saw that in your request, you're requesting customer A, I'm going to send you to cell two, customer three, I'm going to send you to cell three, and so on and so forth. So you can also do this a bit more advanced. You can use consistent hashing, um, or you could, it, this is something that um, I have not, uh, I am going to have, a, hopefully I'm going to have a proof of concept of that, um, demoing uh, at an event, possibly at uh, reInvent, but an advanced um, mapping is very useful for when you have many customers, multi-tenant environment on across many cells. And I got this idea from the token bucket algorithm. So token bucket algorithm is used for rate limiting. That's how you build rate limiting systems. So I had this similar idea where you would basically put your tenants, put your customers into a bucket and you would um, assign metadata to that bucket and score based on that. And that metadata, um, could be many things, like things that you care about a, a customer. So the size of the customer, the level of the customer, if they're enterprise, if they've signed an enterprise agreement, if they are a free, free-tiered customer, 
um, and if um, if they have this many active users, they have about average of this many requests per second, this many requests per month, and that would decide how they get shuffled. That would decide how they get put into these different cells. So if you don't have something like that, what might happen is that you might have a busy customer. Uh, it's an enterprise. Uh, they have so many users uh, coming in. Um, you have uh, millions of requests per month coming in, and you would have multiple of those on this cell. And then what you might have is that you might have a few startups, um, customers who are like only 200 users or something like that in this cell. So what you end up happening is that this cell becomes very busy. This one becomes very quiet and underutilized. So that way, with that tenant scoring algorithm, uh, you can score your tenants. Again, store that value after you score them into that key value mapping. This doesn't need to be any complicated. Um, you, would, you would put that into this key value mapping, and that way you would do your routing. That gives you a lot of flexibility for how you bin pack uh, these customers across uh, so many different cells. So I've, I've been talking about the benefits throughout the presentation, um, but I want to kind of like summarize it here. Uh, the first and the most important benefit to me is reducing blast radius. So if I can have maybe just 10% of customers fail versus all of them having a full failure, I will take it. Um, so it's very helpful in reducing blast radius. It also is easier to scale out. So depending on your workload, um, you can only make this database as big. You can make the servers as, as big. You can scale up as much until it's not effective anymore. And when you're scaling up, when you're making your cells bigger, you're actually putting more uh, you know, tenants and customers on in that cell. So you're making the, the customers that might actually be affected by one cell, you're making the number bigger. So it's best to keep the cell smaller. And like I said, it depends on your workload and use case of how big or small your cells are going to be. But um, essentially, it becomes easier to scale this out. And that is a good thing with the uh, cloud platforms is that you have infinite amount of resources. Um, and I'm saying this because like most people are now on, on some sort of cloud platform. So they are able to just look at the, with the click of a button, um, add servers, add load balancers, add databases. They don't have to rack servers up or anything like that. So if you are using any cloud, cloud platforms, this is a, becomes a huge advantage. You can just build scale, destroy as you wish, right? So scaling out becomes much easier. You can also do changes to your software deployment process. So if you are, when you cutting a new release, if you are sending it 100% to all your customers, you can do um, graduate rollouts when you would send um, the, new software to first 10%. And if there's no, there's no, obviously you would do your testing beforehand, but in my experience, a lot of times what um, the software engineers face is that they uh, face problems like, oh, we had done our testing, but we missed this one thing that caused an outage, or we had done our testing, but this traffic pattern triggered um, this type of behavior that we were not expecting. Those things happen. So you can, uh, with this uh, method, you can send your traffic, you know, first to this cell. If it's success, continue to the next cell and then continue to the other cell. If it's not success, roll it back and figure out what went wrong. So you are able to do very sophisticated software deployments. Um, this is going to increase your confidence in software deployments because you know that if you run that job that you know has your new deploy on these servers uh, that if it fails it's just going to be a limited amount of uh, customers but also that you're able to roll it back um, 
it will, in, you know, increasing confidence, it has, I'm pretty sure, has direct correlation to your increased deployment frequency. You would be more inclined to uh, deploy every day or deploy every hour. Um, uh, if, it, you know, it deploying frequently makes everyone happy. Um, nobody likes to have many changes going in all at once, once a year, <laughs> even once a month. Um, so you will be able to have more confidence in your deployments. And as a result, you're going to be able to deploy more frequently because you know you have that chance to roll it back. The other, if I would say that the main two benefits to this, uh, two main benefits to this uh, solution is that it reduces the blast radius, but also very little changes required to your existing stack. A lot of times when you are trying to fix your architecture or fix uh, your software or anything like that, it becomes difficult to um, move any further because it's anything you would want to do requires the re-architecture, modernization. We need to do this thing differently. Um, so with this way, you would just have the copies of your of the same thing and like I said, especially if you're on any cloud provider, you would just have your servers, your database, your load balancer, and you just repeated n plus one n many times, and you would just have you have to build that router layer on top. So you don't need to re-architect, you don't need to do microservices or containers or anything like that. You're just separating the cells and routing the traffic differently. Mm, there are challenges. You might have been thinking about them as I've been talking. Um, nothing comes without challenges. There are de definitely challenges. The first one is obviously organizational buy-in. Yes, deploying more cells means more money. You're, uh, you know, having more infrastructure obviously means you're going to spend a bit more money to keep that up. But also, you might be able to make yourself smaller than what they currently are and scale them out instead of scaling them up. That might be a thing you would do. And also priorities, right? If if it matters a lot to your business that you're going to have an outage, um, then this is what you need to do. Um, at my previous job, when we ran authentication as a service, that was the business. It mattered a lot. I remember I was... Um, one time uh, there was an outage that lasted three seconds, resolved in 200 requests failing, and I still had to write a postmortem explaining to customers why this happened and why this wouldn't happen again. Um, because it's just so important uh, to not have authentication fail. Like imagine if an uh, airline is using us as an authentication and everyone is trying to check in to their flights and suddenly we're down and we're down for all of us, then um, no one can log in, no one can check in. So that's a disaster. So um, it, you know, it's a priority. If it's a priority for you to not have as many outages, if it's a priority for you to not have long outages, if you're suspect of that, this is an easier organizational buy. Um, another thing is, I don't deny that there is the need for infrastructure to be. Um, abstracted away in a, in a way because spinning up cells uh, could be easy, could be not easy. Um, in it, if it would be, even if we talk about on-prem, uh, even if we talk about cloud platforms where you can do things with a click of a button, if your company is big to be in either multiple clouds or multiple regions of one cloud uh, or have a lot of uh, infrastructure set up, if you don't have existing tooling that spins up infrastructure, if you're not using infrastructure as code like Terraform or CloudFormation, you might have a harder time um, justifying this. Versus if you do have um, battle-tested infrastructure tooling that you can just say, hey, spin up another cell with just one click of a button, one request, one command line um, command, then it will be much more easier. And I personally have had this problem uh, where spinning up infrastructure took such a long time because we had so much technical debt that we hadn't had time to take care of. We hadn't had the proper tooling that we needed to fix. But over time with prioritizing that, we were able to spin up cells um, 
an infrastructure. We took it from um, the, the tooling that I built. Well, we took it from, I think, many weeks, multiple weeks to a couple of minutes of you running a command. So it is possible to do that, but I'm not going to deny that there is a need for good infrastructure tooling. The other um, challenge is your customer data. If you need to move the customer data from uh, this cell to this cell, for example, if you have a failure in this cell, or if you um, have a mechanism where customer A and B are here and customer C is here, customer B is becoming a noisy neighbor and you want to move it around, you should have a way of moving around this data into um, the other cell, into the other database in a completely secure way so that you're not causing any um, issues with the data. So that is kind of like a data mi migration job, right? So that also becomes a challenge where you would need to consider, that's a tool you would need to consider. But still, it's not required necessarily for you to start putting your infrastructure into cells or start thinking about architecting your infrastructure into cells. Because again, just having one of these cells fail is better than having all of them, uh, all the infrastructure to fail at once. The other thing is, uh, like I mentioned, hotkeys, like the tenants, the customers. What if two busy customers are in one cell? That is a challenge. I gave you some pointers on how you would fix that potentially. Um, and it's also a decision too, other than shuffle sharding, which is pretty effective, it's doable. Um, how do you decide where to put each customer? So if you want to say maybe a customer is big enough to have their own cell, um, and how would you um, put different customers that are in different tiers, how would you bin pack them into different cells is also another uh, challenge that you might have, depending on how big your infrastructure is, how many customers you have, how many requests you have coming in, and so on and so forth. So that is definitely a challenge. But there are success stories. Like I mentioned, this works greatly beneath a lot of AWS services. It works great with Route 53. I have put a blog post here about, this is from Amazon's Builder Library, which is where they talk about the best practices and how they do things. So this is a topic of shuffle sharding and doing fault off uh, tolerant and isolation. So this is a good read. Um, the AWS global infrastructure itself is um, another way you can achieve fault tolerance with cells like this. And it's another success stories of cells because you have different regions. So you would have multiple regions in the United States, right? So you can deploy your infrastructure across this region. So, you know, you know, you can deploy it to east regions or west regions, so on and so forth. But also each of those regions is built up of availability zones. Um, and those availability zones are completely separate. Like they're physical, they're multiple. Each of those availability zones are multiple data centers that are uh, close enough to each other to provide uh, database replication across the availability zones. But uh, they're also far enough to uh, prevent failures like earthquake, floods, and stuff from affecting each other. So the, their global infrastructure is a way to see it as a success story of cell-based architecture and also how you can utilize it to uh, get to that place. Um, they also have a, a white paper on um, how they built their block storage, um, EBS. So. Uh, it's called Millions of Tiny Databases, and they basically try to get around Cap Theorem uh, in total. And I have uh, linked a YouTube link right here uh, where uh, Amazon CTO Werner Vogels talks about that paper. Um, he usually just preaches and talks about the service architecture um, every year at the stage on reInvent. Hence why all the success stories are from AWS. This is just the thing, they the term they coined. Um, so that's also a good video to watch as an inspiration of um, how this is done at scale. 
Um, and I know not uh, everyone requires to have this type of scale or requires this type of sophistication, but it is a good method to keep in mind to uh, when you're building systems so you uh, reduce the blast radius and outages for your customers. And I believe that's all I have. This is the sponsor slide made possible by these amazing sponsors. Um, and if you have any questions, if you're interested, and this is a topic that I um, am really passionate about and I like helping people and discussing with people how they can achieve uh, a more fault tolerant uh, and resilient infrastructure. Um, if you wanna talk more about it, reach out to me on any of these platforms. Uh, I can put them in the chat right here. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, everyone. If you don't have any questions, then if you have any questions, please reach out to me. I'll be happy to answer. If you don't have any questions, then uh, thank you so much for attending this event.